Jeff Sununian. And I'm Markel Shea, welcoming you back to another episode of iBerkshire's TV. We'd like to say thank you to the sponsor of this week's show, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Later on, we'll be talking to Pete Marchetti about the Pittsfield 4th of July Parade, and Adam Select Board Chairperson Christine Hoyt stops in to discuss all things Adams. But first, here are our top headlines as being reported by your local news source, iBerkshire's.com. The Adams Cheshire Regional School District chose Pittsfield Crosby School Principal Aaron Dean as its new superintendent. He will replace John Vosberg. Dean was interviewed for the position along with Betch Toquette, current principal of Northampton's Bridge Street School. Dean won support from the board with his specific experience and connection to the district that he taught in for more than 10 years, as well as his involvement with the McCann Tech School Committee. The Adams Cheshire Committee also accepted a grant of $6,000 in General Dynamics to help fund science, technology, engineering, and math programs, otherwise called STEM. $2,000 will go to each school. The town of Clarksburg is considering a master plan to prioritize infrastructure projects. Town meeting authorized a $1 million borrowing to be split between the town and the school. The idea for a master plan was raised at a recent meeting of school officials and the school renovation committee, which is trying to make repairs after a $19 million school project was rejected in 2017. Select board chairman Ron Boucher said school business manager Jennifer Maxey had to offer had offered to develop an RFP to solicit master plan bids. It was pointed out that there are more projects ahead and a plan to prioritize those needs would provide a roadmap for future boards. North Adams City Council President Keith Bono was the winner of Jack's Hot Dog Stand's Hot Dog Eating Contest this past weekend. He was joined in the chow down by local residents Kevin Lascarbo and Evan Garzina. Professional leader Kevin Straley better known as the LA Beast also participated in the contest traveling all the way from his home in New Jersey. Besides taking the title, Mr. Bona also raised $1,600 for the Berkshire Food Project by collecting pledges of $80 per dog. The program provides free lunches to people in the area. Kim McMahon, executive director of the Berkshire Food Project, said Mr. Bona's efforts for the program are especially huge since they don't receive any state or federal grants and that they operate based on what the community provides them. Jeff Lovanos, owner-operator of Jack's Hot Dogs was so moved he donated $500 to veteran services. The new Williams Inn officially opened its doors in Williamstown last week at the bottom of Spring and Latham Streets. With 64 rooms, the design of the new building is a downsized replacement for the older 100-room inn at Field Park. Williams College bought the old Williams Inn in 2014, but it was deemed outdated and energy inefficient. The new $32 million building is hoped to be a community hub and economic catalyst, especially for local businesses. Pittsfield City Council is still battling the issue of downtown parking. Members agreed to have the city solicitor craft an order to have the newly constructed Summer Street surface lot have 90 minutes of free parking instead of the current 30. Berkshire Nautilus owner Jim Raymondetta originally brought the topic into discussion when the Columbus Avenue parking garage was torn down and the meters took the place of free 90-minute parking. Seven councillors voted in favor of allowing 90 minutes of free parking, while four felt changing things on the whim would be worse for the downtown. Former Great Barrington assistant tax collector Deborah Ball was arraigned in Superior Court on August 14th for what officials are calling a Ponzi scheme. Ball is accused of taking real estate and excise taxes that residents and business, owner, business owners paid in cash and covering it up by applying portions of check payments made by others. The alleged scheme was uncovered in 2018 through an audit by Scanlon and Associates. Town manager Mark Kruensky says the town will continue to work closely with auditors and state authorities until the matter is resolved. As for Ball, she was indicted on July 31st and is charged with embezzlement by a municipal officer and larceny after close to 35 years of employment with the town. We would like to once again thank our main sponsor for this week's show, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. We're going to take a short break to learn a bit about what they do, and when we return, Andy McKeever sits down with Peter Marchetti, president of the Pittsfield Parade Committee. I fell on the court while I was training. I broke my wrist. What was going to happen to me? Would I ever be able to play tennis again? Would I recover fully? I went immediately to Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. When Deb first came to the office, she had a lot of anxiety. It was clear just from the x-rays that she would require surgery to help correct the fracture. With all the hard work and the great care that I got from Dr. Nan Coombe, I'm back. 
Partnership is powerful medicine. I'm here with uh, Pittsfield 4th of July Parade Committee President Peter Marchetti. Uh, the Pittsfield Parade has a, a real long history, um, and it's the it's the biggest one. It's been noted nationally for um, you know how you know how it brings everybody together. This year we had a a threat to it. Uh, the fundraising was really down, and there was a huge community effort to to keep this this treasured parade going and uh, in the end here we're gonna have one next year so uh, we just kind of want to recap you know what happened and um, so Peter can you tell me what what was the situation this year so this year's situation um, really has been something we've been talking about for five years mm -hmm. you know for the last five years we've been saying that fundraising has not met the levels that we've been looking for um, in order to do the parade. And so we've been tapping into the reserves. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of face the, um, the banker in me says, if you only raise $65,000, you can only put on a $65,000 parade. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of me says, well, if you only raise $65,000, but you have reserves in the bank, you can tap on the reserves. We're in, we were in a pretty down economic time, mm -hmm. and so maybe things would kind of turn around. Um, and so we were using the reserves over the last five years, and we kind of have been sounding the alarm mm -hmm. over the last five years. Um, and it's funny, you used the word threat. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was trying to be very careful to not make it a threat, to mm -hmm. say, you know, hey, um, if you don't do this, then these are the repercussions. And it was more, how can we make it a rally cry for mm -hmm. the community to come together and save an event that I think, mm -hmm. and now I think I know, um, is a treasured event um, for most of Pittsfield and Berkshire County and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we kind of put the message out there that um, if we have the same fundraising year this year that we've had in the previous years, that money plus the reserves would put us at zero dollars. Mm -hmm. And the efforts of trying to do a 2020 parade would not be feasible for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, you said you didn't want to make it a threat, and um, obviously it's going to come across. A lot of people are going to get, get scared of that. So I mean, what was that decision to actually kind of come out and, and make this a real rally cry? I mean, how hard was that to make? Well, it was tough because, um, you know, in anything you do in the community, mm -hmm. um, the way that you say it and the way it's perceived, mm -hmm. um, and, and you probably know better than I, um, with all of your journalistic background, that you may write a story mm -hmm. thinking that you're fair and impartial and, and just putting the facts out there, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have one side that says, oh no, you were so twisted here, mm -hmm. and one side that was so twisted here. Um, we just tried to put the information out there to say, mm -hmm. um, if this is something that you folks really wanna see continue, mm -hmm. we need your help. And ironically, um, within, 24 to 36 hours of the information being released and, and you know, all of the various uh, stories that were out there, the community was coming together and putting together pasta dinners mm -hmm. with, with dancing to follow. Uh, there was Rock the Fourth that was put together that really came out of non-parade committee people. Mm -hmm. um, these were just people that wanted to come together and, and you know, put the parade together. Um, we had a gentleman come in early on mm -hmm. um, and asked me some questions about the parade and, you know, are you tired of doing it? Is that why you're mm -hmm. giving up? You know, what's going on? And, and my answer was, if we can raise the money, we'll do it. And he turned and went, I have two conditions. Um, one, you continue doing it. And two, I remain anonymous, but I pledge $20,000. Oh, wow. And that was kind of like an eye opener to mm -hmm. me of, you know, okay, how do we do this? And of course, um, that information remained, you know, confidential until mm -hmm. July 4th because, yeah. um, you know, one donation and, and although it was very significant, mm -hmm. doesn't put us over the edge. Mm -hmm. um, what was, you know, very exciting, uh, we saw the, the community, we saw Senator Hines really behind and, and mm -hmm. ask for a state appropriation um, in the budget under economic development mm -hmm. um, for the parade, um, we put ourselves back in a place mm -hmm. where um, all of the money for the 2020 parade mm -hmm. was raised along with all the money for the 19 parade mm -hmm. in one fundraising year. Um, and so when we kick off the fundraising plan for mm -hmm. 2020, it's really gonna be we're raising funds 
uh, for 2021, mm -hmm. and we're going to spend you know the first six months of parade planning for 2020 mm -hmm. really doing two things: one, planning the parade, mm -hmm. but two, um, how do we get ourselves in a place where we're never in that spot of mm -hmm. if you don't help us, we will die. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, long-term sustainability is going to be our game plan for 20. Um, end of 2019 and beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a lot of people sort of, um, you know, over the years, they, they just kind of got used to the parade. You know, they'll go and they'll do it. And they don't, I don't think they really realize what happens behind the scene. So can you just give me, like, you know, how much does just one of these parades cost? And, uh, you know, what does that money go for? So it, it depends on, you know, what we've done. We've had parades that have cost Eighty thousand, mm -hmm. um, and we've had parades that have cost about sixty-five. So um, there are, and the easiest way to explain it, there are three major pieces. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost is the music, mm -hmm. um, and so we set a music budget of thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. I know everybody thinks that all the musical units come to Pittsfield for free. Mm -hmm. um, that is not the case, um, and people ask, well, why do you have to pay them? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're bringing in a drum corps from Long Island, um, they need to rent buses, they have their equipment trucks, they have all their equipment, and it costs them money to be, you know, traveling. They're, they're trained professionals, right. I and mean, that's what they do for, for a living, so. It, it, I mean, it costs them money to, to be here. Um, you know, they have to worry about how long they're going to be on the road, how many meals they need to take. Um, you know, we have, um, which people probably don't realize, but uh, we have more times than I can count, mm -hmm. put drum corps up in a school gymnasium, mm -hmm. and that was their hotel room for the night. Mm -hmm. um, they slept on the gym floor, and they used the um, showers in the school. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's their accommodations. But if you have a core of 100 plus people, yeah. um, and you're feeding them breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, you know they just didn't come to Pittsfield. They've, you know, made a tour of it. Um, so music. Uh, it, on average, is about thirty thousand mm -hmm. um, balloons. Mm -hmm. um, is about twenty thousand for four, four giant helium balloons. That gets us the balloon. Mm -hmm. That gets us the helium, um, and the balloon company uh, travels to Pittsfield um, with four of their um, trained staff mm -hmm. to work with our volunteers yeah. to get the balloons blown up. Teach the people how to. Um, maneuver the balloons so mm -hmm. that they can get them under the wires and under the street lights mm -hmm. um, and not pop them. Um, <laughs> I was going to chime in because you did tell me earlier <laughs> right. that, yeah, you did it, pop one once. And so. not pop them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in, in the 18 plus years I've been doing this, yeah. I've only known of one balloon yeah. that, that didn't make it. Um, and so, you know, there's two that between the two um, are close to fifty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars, and on top of that, um, we need to supply rooms for the um, balloon company, mm -hmm. for their for their staff, um, and then you know the third biggest thing that we have is our program booklet um, that we put out each year um, that runs between ten and eleven thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so three things puts the parade at, at sixty one thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You know, and people will say, well, why do you need that booklet? Um, I'm not sure I need the booklet, but the booklet is where all the ads from all of the sponsors go. Mm -hmm. So if we took that away, what do you have to entice right. um, folks to For the sponsors to sponsor the parade? Mm -hmm. All right, and where does the, the, all that funding come from? Because I think a lot of people think that the city just pays of all this. So, but, so, but this is obviously a, a fundraising, and it's a parade committee that's separate. So where does where does this money come from? So the money comes in a variety of, of places. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, an oldie show each year. The Oldies But Goodies gang puts on a show for us mm -hmm. um, at a local high school. Uh, it's a weekend long event. Usually raises between ten and fifteen thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. They're all volunteers helping us raise money. Um, we have a you know parade drive each mm -hmm. year to raise money, um, and we solicit local business sponsorship. So um, we've had prior to this year, mm -hmm. three main ways of raising money that um, just haven't met our goals. Mm -hmm. And so this year we added some additional fundraising events. But you know the city um, provides some in-kind services. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there's no financial support whatsoever mm -hmm. from the city for the parade. Yeah. And I, the state 
funding you got this year, that was a one-time thing. I don't remember that happening it's, it, before. It's never happened before. Yeah. Um, and I've been told to ask for it again because you'd be amazed at the number of requests that, mm. that come in. Um, I would have never even thought to ask for it. Right. So, you know, we commend Senator Hines for doing that, mm -hmm. and we'll work with him in the future to see if we can make it happen again. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, it's an interesting story about how you know this is this is a gem for uh, the city of Pittsfield, and it has been since 1812. <laughs> That's 1812. The history. Right. That's the history to it. And uh, you know, so this community really came together to make sure that that this longstanding tradition continues. So uh, thank you very much for coming on and telling me about thank it. Thank you. So. Thank you to Peter Marchetti for stopping in and discussing the Pittsfield Parade with us. Mm -hmm. We do appreciate him coming in. And you also sat down with Christine Hoyt, Adams Select Board Chairperson, to talk about some issues that Adams is facing. I'm joined now by the Chairperson of the Adams Select Board, Christine Hoyt. First of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you've been on the board now. Uh, we met uh, many years ago, just so people know. We do. I live in Adams. She lives in Adams. Yep. She took my seat I on did. the select board. <laughs> I, I want to make it very clear that I didn't run that year. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, and this is your, you're, you're up for re-election next year. Yes, in May. So I am in um, the third year of my first term. But you are not here to talk about your running for re-election. Uh, the first thing we're going to cover in the town of Adams is you guys have been dealing with whether or not uh, to install a 40 r overlay district, which sounds really complicated, but it is not. It's actually kind of basic when you break it down. Uh, give us the particulars of the 40 r district and what it would mean for the town of Adams. Sure. So um, as, as you probably remember from when you were on the board, um, housing stock is always a hot topic in the town of Adams. We have a housing stock that's uh, over 80 years old, most of which is uh, in our downtown area that needs to be upgraded. So it's been a hot topic um, for the board to, to look at. So in the spring, we met with Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. We had a workshop to talk about some different options, and 40R is one of them. Uh, 40R is, as you mentioned, the smart growth zoning um, and housing overlay district program that was put forward by the state about 15 years ago. It's um, widely used in the eastern part of the state um, to create some housing in some uh, dense population uh, areas. So what it would mean for Adams, at least what we talked about, is we looked at some of the town-owned buildings that we have and how we could attract a developer to come to Adams and create some housing opportunities in some of those properties. So you've got like Memorial School, um, now 20 East Street, because that will be uh, vacated. That was the community center and youth center. Um, the school district has mentioned that at some point they would like to all be on one campus, which would open Plunkett up at some point, hopefully many years from now. Um, but we're just trying to plan for that type of growth that could happen. It probably streamlines the process a little bit. I know some of the buildings that you're talking about are zoned now industrial or commercial or whatever they may be. Yeah. Um, this sort of opens the door for a developer to come in and say, okay, you can build housing in this building. It's already set. Uh, um, but there are some stipulations that 40R comes with. But the town does keep control, a little more control, if 40R weren't involved. Correct. There are pluses and minuses like everything that happens to anything that you implement in the town zoning-wide. Absolutely. Um, give me some of the positives that 40R might bring in. So 40R, um, it will attract a developer because there are some uh, incentives for the developer. But for the town, there are some financial incentives. So right out of the gate, there's a one-time payment. Um, it's, a, I think, a zoning incentive payment uh, program that depending on the number of units you've identified for your community, you will get so much money. So the maximum uh, amount that you can get, I think, is $600,000. Um, and that's why we took an approach at looking at everything and putting it all on the table and trying to find as many units as possible so that we can max out on that one-time payment um, once we adopt 40R, or if, if we are able to. The other is that the town would get a payment of $3,000 per unit that is developed. So that would happen. That also, 40R also uh, gives the town 
the ability to um, have a school impact reimbursement as part of the, the zoning overlay district. And I think that's important because you, all of a sudden you add 200 brand new units to a town, it's obviously going to attract people, it's going to attract people with children, especially if it's affordable. Yep. Um, so you're going to have an influx at the school, which, which I think in our school district uh, is nothing but a positive. We know we've right. been losing students. The whole county has been losing students. We have room in the district to, um, to bring in more students, um, and that's what this is about. We would like to attract more families to the town of Adams um, and, and make it uh, affordable for them, but also to have some wonderful housing options. And uh, I know, obviously, uh, in Adams, it's been a big deal for a while. Uh, we've had a couple of developers in town who came in and wanted to do a project, and 40 hours was not installed, so they sort of backed away, and due to other reasons as well. Right. Um, but this is not, it's not a program. You have this going on in towns like Haverhill, town I used to live in. Yep. Blue Collar, Old Mills. Then you have Northampton, Great Barrington, Pittsfield, Marblehead, and yep. suburban towns like Danvers. Uh, Reading. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that goes on all over the state. Uh, in those towns that it's happening right now, you'll find people who still didn't want to put it in. You'll find right. people who are thrilled. Um, I know the board is debating it. It's been a hotly debated issue in the town. Uh, when will it come up next? What's the next step? Sure. So the uh, board of selectmen did um, come to some consensus back in the spring when we met with Berkshire Regional Planning Commission to move forward with 4DR, um, and so we moved it forward to the planning board, and the planning board has, been, has spent the last four months uh, working on a bylaw. Their public hearing process uh, just took place this last month, which put it, everything on the radar that uh, this is uh, what Adams is looking at and what we're talking about, um, and they will be meeting again at the end of September to um, to review the bylaw again and uh, possibly adopt it. If they do, it would then move to the Board of Selectmen to put it on the town meeting warrant um, and maybe a special town meeting either this fall or early spring. So eventually it's gonna be the people who are gonna decide. Correct. You're gonna draft the best, uh, well, you're gonna draft the best warrant possible, you're gonna draft yep. the best plan possible, goes through you people, and then it's gonna go to town meeting and they're the ones who are gonna decide. Correct. Correct. Along with along with 40R, uh, you guys have been implementing a lot of business fr business friendly measures in Adams, yep. uh, which we could use a lot of vacant buildings like <laughs> everywhere again, like everywhere. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about a couple of those. Sure. So um, we are starting to we put in place a couple of years ago the uh, ribbon cutting program um, to help new businesses get off on the right foot to uh, get a little press and promotion about their new business. And it also just creates some nice positive uh, it, it, stories and, and a nice positive vibe that's going on. So that was something we put in place, um, I think in 2017. And since then, we've been trying to work on streamlining the process within town hall. So when somebody comes to open up a new business, who are they meeting with? Um, and then what boards, committees, commissions do they now need to meet with to get all of their permits in place? So with um, Jay Green coming on as our town administrator, he's been really focused on streamlining that process. I think he's playing with the um, language of a, a road map to grand opening or a pathway to grand opening. Um, and right now when somebody comes in and says, I want to open up a business, they are meeting with community development and the town administrator. Uh, last year, town meeting did approve the position of a senior planner. And that position does fall in community development and has helped to walk some of our smaller businesses through that permitting process with um, if it's zoning, if it's planning, um, and in some cases the Conservation Commission, just making sure that they all know what needs to happen and when and when those meetings are set up. So um, everybody in town hall is talking to one another and departments are meeting with new businesses uh, right up front. I think that's great news. Almost a little bit of a hand-holding, walking you right through town hall. It is. Um, so we hope to announce something a little bit more formal in the next couple of months, but we're trying out a process with a couple of uh, 
businesses that have identified Adams as their new home, and uh, and hopefully we'll have some announcements on those businesses as well. Give us something a little more exciting. I think we've bored everyone enough <laughs> with very important stuff for yes. the town of Adams and really other towns too. They're going to go through it, uh, but give us something fun coming up in the near future in Adams. So, well, I don't know if it's fun. Well, it's fun for me, um, and I don't think any of this is that boring, um, <laughs> but I'm always looking for people to join different boards, committees, um, uh, commissions. We have vacancies that need to be filled. Uh, so I always encourage people to just get involved in town government. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about what that could look like. Uh, we just, you talked about town meeting being the ultimate uh, deciding board uh, when it comes to 40R and some other items. We have eight seats that are vacant. We're still a representative town meeting. It's easy to get on the ballot and to get involved um, for that. But there are other things you don't have to run for, and I'd be happy to put somebody in touch with um, a, a board or a committee that they are interested in. So that's the stuff that excites me to get more people involved um, and, and have more uh, conversation. But in terms of exciting events, I know that the Adam Suffrage uh, Centennial Committee has been hard at work raising money to put on a six-month uh, festival um, and programming for next year to celebrate the 200th uh, birthday of Susan B. Anthony as well as the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. I think so. this is going to take on a life of its own. We have people working like crazy to put it on, yeah. and I think it's going to get bigger than possibly even they imagine. Yeah. And that's going to be a lot of fun coming up. 2020 is the year of Adams. It's going to be incredible. It is. Christine Hoyt is our friend. <laughs> she came in to say hello, and we thank, thank you, you very Jeff. much. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks again to Christine for that information. In other Adams news, the selectmen have approved the ratification of two new police officers. The selectmen were happy to appoint new reserve officer Christopher Lampiazzi and special police officer Robert Mallett to the department. Police Chief Richard Tarza said Lampiazzi, an Adams resident, has been through the Reserve Academy. He currently works for MCLA's security office and is a part-time officer in Peru. As for Mallet, Tarza said he has worked as a provisional officer for Adams in the past and will work as a special officer, which means he will only be able to work the desk, security, and traffic details. Traf uh, Tarza said Mallet retired at the rank of captain after 39 years with the Berkshire County Sheriff's Department, but that he is up to date on all his credentials and qualifications and will be an asset to the town. Up until the 2019 football season, Massachusetts was one of a handful of states that operated under un NCAA rules for high school sports. This year, coaches will have to acquaint their players with new rules under the National Federation of State High School Associations. President of the Berkshire County Football Officials Association, Mark Field, said that a lot of changes have to do with penalty enforcement, which will come as a big change to players. Not only will these rules affect the players, but officials too. Field said the changes will require a learning curve, but officials associations in Western Mass have tried to get ahead of that curve by conducting training for their members and meetings for coaches. The sculptures known as the Guardian Project will be removed from Natural Bridge State Park in North Adams this fall because their deterioration is considered a safety hazard. Eight local youth artists through the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition created the Guardian Project back in 2004 with the vision of a guardian that would watch over and protect the natural beauty of the area. Many of the concrete sculptures are no longer recognizable because of significant fractures and missing pieces. The inability to restore the pieces also becomes a safety risk to those who are wandering in and around the installation. The Department of Conservation and Recreation reached out to the NBCC to determine a plan for removal. The sculptures are set to be removed in the fall. In Lenox, music venue Tanglewood wraps up its 2019 classical programming this week with final performances by the Boston Pops on Saturday, August 24th, and the Boston Symphony Orchestra with vocal soloists as well as the Tanglewood Festival Chorus on Sunday, August 25th. This won't be the end for musical entertainment in the Berkshires, however. The city of Pittsfield is set to host a list of performing artists at South Mountain Concerts for the months of September and October. North Adams department store Peebles is going to be turned into a discount retail store called Gordman's sometime early next year. Blakely Graham, brand publicity manager for Peebles' parent company Stage Stores, confirmed that the location will remain in the Stage Store family. 
Brim also said in an email that current employees will be offered jobs at Gordman's and a job fair for new employees will be held early next year. People's credit cards and gift cards can be used at any of the stage stores, including the one in North Adams, and the Style Circle Rewards program will continue. Lifting Standards men's basketball team had a dramatic victory when they walked away with the A Division overtime game win against Flynn and Dagnoli Kingsbred in the John Giorgi Summer Basketball Men's League at Knoll Field in North Adams. Flynn and Dagnoli held a 26-24 lead at the first half as both teams were tightly contested, but Lifting Standards helped to swing momentum after teammate Cam Stockton scored 11 points for his team. Along with Stockton, Keelan Cross scored two free throws with just 12 seconds left in the game, while teammate Quentin Gittens added two more free throws to bring the score up to 54-50. to Lifting standards ultimately won the division title with a score of 56-53. to Thanks again to our viewers for your support of iBerkshire's TV, as well as to our guests, Pete Marchetti and Christine Hoyt. We'd again like to say a special thank you to our sponsor of this week's episode, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. And thank you again for watching, and please join us again next time for your local news, interviews, and more on iBerkshire's TV.